Hi there, welcome. This course is all about initiating a project successfully. If you haven't gone through our foundational course yet, we recommend checking it out. It covers the foundations of project management and contains lots of helpful information for anyone wanting to start a career in this field. There are lots of people around the world like you who are hoping to learn the skills to get a project management role. Maybe you prefer to take a specialized certification rather than a four-year degree. Maybe you're looking for an affordable way to stand out among competition. Maybe you're interested in changing your career. Whatever your reason for being here, we are glad you've joined us. This program is rooted in the belief that a strong foundation in project management can help anyone start a great career as a project manager. Before we begin this course, let me introduce myself. My name is Juan, and I'll be your instructor for this course. As a senior program manager at Google for the past eight years, I have worked on cross-functional projects involving product managers, software engineers, user experience designers, network operations, customer support, and more to build software used at Google and used by Google Cloud customers. I began my career working as a liaison between customers and engineers documenting requirements on software development projects. As I became involved in larger projects, I started to manage the timelines of the projects and coordinate the work of the different teams that had to get involved to finish the project. Before I knew it, I was the de facto project manager. I have accumulated my knowledge through formal and informal training, finding practical application in finance, insurance, and tech companies. I'm super excited to be sharing with you more about the project management discipline. During this course, you'll learn all the steps for kicking off a project. We'll start with an overview of initiation, which is the phase that allows ideas to come together and form the beginnings of a plan for a project. You'll identify the individual components of initiation, like the project scope, goals, and deliverables. You'll also learn how to measure the success of a project. This is a super important piece of the puzzle. After all, you want to be able to meet or exceed all of the requirements for a successful project, right? Later, we'll talk about how to identify stakeholders. Stakeholders have a direct interest in the project's completion and success. We'll teach you about some really helpful tools you can use to define project roles and responsibilities and more tools and resources you typically need to complete the work of a project. Finally, we'll introduce documentation that can help your team prepare for project kickoff. Exciting, right? The skills you'll learn in this course will help you start projects of your own. We can't wait to get into these topics with you. So let's get started. Meet me in the next video. Welcome back. In the last course, you learn that initiation is the first phase within the project life cycle, followed by planning, executing, and closing. Makes sense, right? Regardless of your chosen methodology, all projects have to start somewhere. Let's talk more about initiation and why it's important for the success of a project. Because initiation is the first phase of the project, it's really important to get it right. A well-planned initiation results in a strong foundation for your project and sets it up for success. Initiation begins after a problem or opportunity has been identified within an organization. Often stakeholders like senior leaders at a company will initiate a project to address a specific need for the business. For example, perhaps the company would like to roll out a new product, improve employee well-being, or reduce costs in a certain department. It's your responsibility as the project manager to help identify the project goals, resources, and other details based on initial discussions with the project stakeholders. Even though someone else might come up with an idea for the project, it's still your job to figure out all the important pieces that need to come together in order to get the work done. The initiation phase is a crucial time for asking stakeholders the right questions, performing research, determining resources, and clearly documenting the key components of a project. Doing this will help you solidify the scope or the boundary of the project. If this seems a bit overwhelming, don't worry. 
We'll talk more about project scope later on in this course. If a project isn't initiated properly, things can go wrong pretty fast. For example, without sufficient understanding of the project's goals, you might underestimate what resources you need or how long the project might take. Or without agreeing with stakeholders on what success looks like, you might think the project was completed successfully, while the stakeholders might think it didn't accomplish their goals. Getting on the same page and gaining clarity during the initiation phase can save a lot of time and extra work for everyone throughout the project. Proper initiation also helps ensure that the benefits of the project outcomes will outweigh the costs of the project. To determine this, you'll do what's called a cost-benefit analysis, which is the process of adding up the expected value of a project, the benefits, and comparing them to the dollar cost. To do this, you will work with stakeholders to consider a few questions. To determine the benefits of a project, those questions might include, what value will this project create? How much money could this project save our organization? How much money will it bring in from existing customers? How much time will be saved? How will the user experience be improved? And to determine the costs of the project, those questions might include, how much time will people have to spend on this project? What will be the one-time costs? Are there any ongoing costs? What about long-term costs? The benefits of a project should always outweigh the costs. So it's really important that you consider these questions early on. Coming up, we'll talk more about the initiation phase and explore the key components of initiating a project. Bye for now. Hello, and welcome back. You just learned about the initiation phase of the project lifecycle and why it's so important to get it right. Next, I'll teach you about the key components that make up initiation and how these pieces lead to the planning phase of a project. There are several key components of initiation that you need to consider in order for your project to be successful. Goals, scope, deliverables, success criteria, stakeholders, and resources. First, you need to consider the goals of a project. The goal is what you've been asked to do and what you're trying to achieve. All projects should have clear goals, and often those will be determined by senior company leaders with your help. From there, you would begin to consider the project scope. This is the process to define the work that needs to happen to complete the project. You also need to consider project deliverables. These are the tangible and intangible outcomes of a project. Once the goals, scope, and deliverables are determined, you need to consider success criteria. Success criteria are the standards by which you measure how successful a project was in reaching its goals. Another important consideration is your stakeholders. Stakeholders are key to making informed decisions at every step of the project, including the initiation phase. They're the people who both have an interest in and are affected by the completion and success of a project. As a result, they're often instrumental in determining the goals, objectives, deliverables, and success criteria of a project, from coming up with the idea to outlining their expectations of its results. As you move through the initiation phase, it's your job to ensure that you understand the needs of the project's stakeholders early on. It's also your role to ensure that all stakeholders are in agreement on the goals and overall mission of the project before moving on to the next phase. Now, let's talk about resources. Resources generally refer to the budget, people, materials, and other items that you'll have at your disposal. It's super important to think carefully about those pieces early on. No one wants to get started on a project only to realize halfway through that they don't have enough money or enough people to complete the work. That would be a mess. Finally, once you've established your goals, scope, deliverables, success criteria, stakeholders, and resources, it's time to create a project charter. A 
project charter is a document that contains all the details of a project. Project charters clearly define the project and its goals and outline what is needed to accomplish them. A project charter allows you to get organized, set up a framework for what needs to be done, and communicate those details to others. Once you've drafted the charter, you would then review the document with key stakeholders to get their approval to move into the planning stage. Coming up, you'll learn more about project charters and even get the chance to create one yourself. Hopefully, you're starting to see how the key components of initiation help lay the foundation of a solid project. During the rest of this course, we'll talk more about each of the components outlined so far. You've come so far and learned so much. Keep up the great work. Hi, my name is Afshin. I'm the director of core capacity at Google, uh, where we support some of our key products such as Google Maps, Google Photos, Google Search, and many more. Uh, ultimately, what we're doing is we're managing the supply and demand for our products in the resource space. So specifically, compute, storage, machine learning, and networking resources. Ultimately, our goal is to provide the fuel for these products so we can support our billions of users. I often look at establishing the project goals. And tied to the goals is discussing the criteria. What's a successful project? What are the measurables involved in the project space? And then lastly, I always want to look at the uh, stakeholders that are involved, maybe our clients, our key stakeholders, and so on, and make sure that they're thought of during the formation of the project. I'm meeting with the stakeholders. I'm trying to understand what they're trying to achieve, what we're trying to achieve, and the goal, if you will, is a critical aspect of setting the scope. When I'm trying to set the goals of a project, I apply very in-depth active listening. I'm doing a lot of socializing uh, with, uh, with stakeholders. I'm meeting a lot of players to understand what's the landscape like. Uh, I, I really am, it's an active listening experience. So I have a recent example of a project that in my view did not do the proper initiation phase. Uh, last week, in fact, a, a group approached me with a process or a feature that they were gonna launch. I reviewed it and immediately realized that they were, they were so far off. Uh, they had not discussed the topic with any of my team members or myself and they were day minus one from launching the feature. It was a total miss. And it really illustrates the point about when you initiate a project, you can't invest enough time in meeting with stakeholders, meeting with your, your colleagues, you know, listening to them, actively listening. Someone uh, taught me recently the value of, of building that listening to learn muscle. And to, in the project initiation phase, to me, that is such a valuable talent. There are those that have it, there are those that haven't learned it, and there are those, those that'll never do it. And I believe it's a, it's a training, trainable skill, but it requires you to really slow down and look at the landscape in front of you. Nice work. You're on your way to becoming a great candidate for roles in project management. We're so glad you've stuck with us, and we hope you're proud of the progress you've made so far. In the last few videos, we've given you a primer on kicking off a project successfully. To recap, you learn more about initiation, the first phase of the project life cycle. Hopefully, you're starting to see how important this phase is for the overall health of a project. As we talked about earlier, a lack of preparation during the initiation stage can lead to problems later on in the project life cycle, like a budget shortage, a missed deadline, or too few teammates to complete the work. But with early planning, you can set your team up for success. We also introduce you to the major factors you should consider during the initiation phase, including goals, scope, deliverables, success criteria, 
stakeholders, and resources. All of these come together in the early plans for a project and are documented in a project charter. Now that you understand the basic elements of initiation, let's dive deeper. Next up, we'll talk about identifying goals and deliverables and learn more about measurement and success criteria. You're doing great and we'll see you soon. Welcome back. By now, you should have a better sense of how the different parts of initiation come together to form the beginnings of a project. So far, you've outlined the key components of project initiation, and most importantly, you've learned that a lack of preparation during this stage can lead to problems later on. We're going to continue honing your project preparation skills. Once we're done here, you'll be able to define and create project goals and deliverables the guiding stars of your project. You'll also be able to define project scope, the boundaries of your project that state what is and is not part of your project. You'll be able to identify what's in scope and out of scope for a project, and you'll be able to recognize scope creep, something you'll need to keep a close eye on to help you reach your project goal. Finally, you'll be able to explain different ways of defining and measuring your project success criteria. Before we get started, I like to talk through an example that will follow for the rest of this course. Imagine that you're the lead project manager at Office Green, a commercial landscaping company that specializes in plant decor for offices and other businesses. The director of product at Office Green has an idea for a new service called Plant Pals to offer high volume customers small low maintenance plants like little cacti, leafy ferns for their desks. As the project manager, you've been tasked with managing the rollout of this new service. As we go through this course, we'll return to your role as the project manager at Office Green to help teach you about project goals, deliverables, and success criteria. You'll also see the role your team and stakeholders play in creating and following these three important components. At the end, you'll compile everything you've learned into a shared document that you can use as a portfolio to share with future employers. After this course, you move on to the next phases of the project life cycle, and so will your Office Green project. Enjoy. Welcome back. In this video, I'll define project goals and deliverables and explain why they're important. Then I'll teach you how to determine whether a goal or deliverable has been well-defined, which means it's got enough detail and information to guide you towards success. First things first, to set up a project for success and to make your job easier, you want to figure out what needs to be done before you actually get started. You need to define exactly what your goals and deliverables are so that you'll be able to tell your team members what to do. You need a clear picture of what you're trying to accomplish, how you're going to accomplish it, and how you know when it has been accomplished. Let's define project goals so that you can start to figure out what your project team needs to do to reach it. A project goal is the desired outcome of the project. It's what you've been asked to do and what you're trying to achieve. For example, your goal could be to improve the response time to customer inquiries via email by 20%. The goal of your Office Green project might be to increase revenue by 5% through a new service called Plant Pals that offers desk plants to top customers by the end of the year. Goals are important because they give you a roadmap to your destination. Without a clear goal in mind, how can you know where to go or how to get there? Now, one of the biggest differences between what makes a good goal and a not so good goal is how well it's defined. Meaning, how clear and specific is the goal? If the goal is your destination, are you confident you'll know when you've arrived? The examples I mentioned before, to improve the response time to customer inquiries via email by 20%, and to increase the office green revenue by 5%, are two well-defined goals because they tell you what you're trying to achieve. But wait, there's more. These goals also tell you how to do what you've been asked to do. In this case, it's via email through a new service offering. And that's not all. These goals clarify the goal even further by saying to improve by 20% and increase by 5%. Now we know where we're going. Well-defined goals are both specific and measurable. They give you a clear sense of what you're trying to accomplish. Really great goals have even more detail, but I'll get to that soon. When you start a project, 
take time to review your goals and make sure they're well-defined. To do this, you might need to get more information from your stakeholders. Talk to them about their vision for the project. Ask how this aligns to the company's larger goals and mission. By the end of that conversation, you and your stakeholders should agree to support the project goals in order to avoid running into issues later on. Here's an example from my own experience as a project manager. Our team had finished a new product feature. Our stated goal was to deliver an early version of this feature and collect user feedback. When we delivered the feature to one of our key customers for user feedback, the customer didn't have anyone available to try it out. Our team debated whether or not we had met our goal if we hadn't collected user feedback. Some felt that we hadn't achieved the stated goal, while others thought we did. The customer was satisfied with our team's ability to deliver a feature in the timeline stated, but our internal team wasted valuable time going back and forth about it. That said, make sure that before you start your project, you, your stakeholders, and your team are all clear on the project's goals so that you know you are making the right kind of progress. I'll teach you a process for how to do this coming up. Once you have the goals nailed down, it's time to examine the project deliverables. Project deliverables refer to the tangible outcomes of the project. In other words, a deliverable is what gets produced or presented at the end of a task, event, or process. Take the goal to improve customer response time. A deliverable for that goal could be the creation of email templates for responding to typical questions. Your Office Screen project goal to increase revenues could have two deliverables launching the plant service, and a finished website that highlights the new kinds of plants being offered. These are considered deliverables because they describe tangible outputs that show stakeholders how additional revenues will be generated. There are all sorts of project deliverable examples. A pretty common one is a report. When a goal is reached, you can visibly see the results documented in a chart, graph, or presentation. Deliverables help us quantify and realize the impact of the project. Just like needing well-defined goals, you need well-defined deliverables for pretty much the same reasons. Deliverables are usually decided upfront with the stakeholders or clients involved in the project. They hold everyone accountable and are typically a big part of achieving the goal. Make sure to ask questions about what the deliverable should be and have everyone share the vision and expectations of the deliverables so you're all on the same page. Coming up, you'll practice the art of defining your goals even further by following the SMART method. Enjoy. Welcome back. By now, you know that goals are important to the success of your project. And you know that they need to be well-defined in order to help keep your project on track. Since your deliverables depend on your goals, it's in your best interest to get those goals as well-defined as possible. Lucky for you, I've got an easy method for doing just that, setting SMART goals. I already mentioned that goals should be specific and measurable. The SMART method to evaluate goals adds three more considerations for success. Be attainable, be relevant, and be time-bound. Put them all together, and what do you have? SMART goals. As an entry-level project manager, you may or may not be setting the project's main goals, but you will need to be able to identify and clarify them as needed. And that's where the SMART method can be a valuable tool. Let's take a closer look at each term. As I've already mentioned, if your goal is not specific, you'll have trouble figuring out how long it should take to complete and whether or not you've accomplished it. For example, if the goal was simply to improve customer service response time, that's not very specific. It does tell you what you want to achieve in general, but it doesn't say anything else. If you've improved response time by 1%, is that enough? If after five years, response time finally goes up, is that enough? How about if only half of your staff improves their response times, but the other half stays the same? Specific goals should answer at least two of the questions I'm about to ask. What do I want to accomplish? Why is this a goal? Does it have a specific reason, purpose, or benefit? Who is involved and who is the recipient? Employees, customers, the community at large? Where should the goal be delivered? And finally, 
To what degree? In other words, what are the requirements and constraints? Next, we want to set goals that are measurable, meaning we can determine that they were objectively met. Measuring is not only a way for people to track progress, but also a tool to help people stay motivated. You can tell if a goal is measurable by asking how much, how many, and how will I know when it's accomplished? Sometimes the success of a goal can be measured with a simple yes or no. Did you learn how to play guitar? Yes or no? You will need to measure most of the goals you have with metrics. Metrics are what you use to measure something like figures or numbers. For example, if your goal was to run a 5K, five kilometer race, then distance in kilometers is your metric. At off the screen, the project goal is to increase revenue by 5%. In this case, revenue is the metric. Lastly, consider benchmarks or points of reference to make sure you're choosing accurate metrics. For instance, if your overall goal is to increase revenue, you can look at last year's data as a benchmark for deciding how much to increase revenue this year. If last year's revenue increased by 3%, then an increase by 5% in a booming economy would be a reasonable goal for this year. Okay, so the goal is specific and measurable, but is it attainable? Can it be reasonably reached based on the metrics? Typically, you want goals that are a little challenging to encourage growth. Otherwise, what's the point of the goal if nothing's going to change? However, you don't want it to be too extreme or you'll never reach it. You'll have failed before you even start it. Aim to find a balance between the two extremes. For example, let's take the goal to run a 5K. Say you regularly run 2.5 kilometers three times a week. An attainable goal would be to go from running 2.5 kilometers to running five kilometers within four weeks. An unattainable goal might be earning first place in a 5K. I mean, it could happen, but it's not likely, especially if you've never run a race before. But how can you know if a goal is attainable if it's unfamiliar? A clue to helping you figure out if your goal is attainable is to ask, how can it be accomplished? Break down the goal into smaller parts and see if it makes sense. Going from 2.5 kilometers to five kilometers over four weeks means increasing your distance by a little over half a kilometer each week. That's not so bad. Use the same process on your office screen project goal. Businesses usually conduct quarterly reviews, so let's assume the increase is expected to occur over the course of a year for four quarters. In order to meet the goal, you need to see an increase of at least 1% each quarter. Seems pretty reasonable to me. What wouldn't be reasonable is setting a goal of increasing revenues by 50% or 100%, unless your research showed that business was improving that quickly. Your goal is specific, measurable, and attainable. Now let's see if it's relevant. In other words, does it make sense to try and reach this goal? Think about how the goal lines up with other goals, priorities, and values. Ask whether the goal seems worthwhile. Does the effort involved balance out the benefits? Does it match your organization's other needs and priorities? Everyone from the client and the project team and the people who will ultimately use the product need to feel like the goal is worth supporting. Also consider the timing. Both the amount of time the project will take as well as the larger economic and social context can have big impacts. There might be a budget to complete the project now, but will the company be able to sustain the project over time? Is there an audience that will continue to use the product or service once it's delivered? Once you've got the answers to these questions, you should have a clear goal to help steer the project. If you still don't feel confident about the project's goals, keep digging. It's okay to ask questions if you have doubts. Communicate your concerns with the project senior stakeholders and your direct supervisor if you have one. They should be able to address some of your concerns so that you can feel confident about moving forward. All right, if you're feeling good about the project being relevant and attainable, and you've made sure it's measurable and has the specifics to keep you and your project team focused, 
The final item on the checklist is to make sure it's time bound. Time bound means your goal has a deadline. Deadlines give you a way to track your progress. Otherwise, you may never reach your goal or never even get started. Time and metrics often go hand in hand because time can also be used as a metric. Making your goal time bound gives you a way to break down how much needs to be accomplished over time. For example, if you need to increase revenues by the end of the year, you can break down how much you need to increase each quarter, month, and week. And there you have it, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound, a nearly foolproof method to create and evaluate your project goals. And you know what they say, work smarter, not harder. As we continue in this module, you learn about project scope and see how having clear goals supports all kinds of other decisions that come up during a project. Welcome back. Project scope is a really important concept that I want to tell you about. You'll hear it come up time and time again throughout each phase of the project life cycle. In fact, you may even find yourself defending it. So let's get acquainted with scope. In this video, you will learn how to define and determine scope. Simply put, your project scope includes the boundaries of a project. The way we define it at Google is an agreed upon understanding as to what is included or excluded from a project. Scope helps ensure that your project is clearly defined and mapped out. That means knowing exactly who the project will be delivered to and who will be using the end result of the project. You also need a firm understanding of the project's complexity. Is it straightforward with an easily manageable list of tasks? Or will it require extensive research, multiple rounds of approvals, and a large scale production process that will take years to complete? Scope also includes the project timeline, budget, and resources. You'll need to clearly define these so that you can make sure you're working within those boundaries and what's actually possible for the project to work. Poorly defined scope or major changes to your scope can cause changes to the budget, timeline, or even final outcome of the project. Let's look at the scope of your office screen project as an example. As a reminder, the new Plant Pals service offers customers small low maintenance plants like cacti and leafy ferns that they can place on their desks. Customers can order them online or from a print catalog and Office Green will ship the plant straight to the customer's work address. Things to consider for your scope then might be whether or not to provide replacement plants, which customer segments will be offered the service, whether or not the online catalog is an app, a website, or both, and how to ensure customers can purchase from the online catalog, whether by phone, PC, Mac, iPhone, or Android. You might also consider the dimensions of the paper catalog and whether it needs to be in color or black and white and on what kind of paper. Now, how do you actually figure out the scope of your project? It's simple. Talk to your sponsors and stakeholders. Understand what their goals are and find out what is, and this is really important, what is not included in the project. We've covered a number of different ways to help you determine scope. Here are a few more helpful questions to add to the list. Where did the project come from? Why is it needed? What is the project expected to achieve? What does the project sponsor have in mind? Who approves the final results? Now you really be set. As for timing, defining project scope should happen during the initial planning stage. You want to start figuring out the scope early on so that everyone can agree to the same set of expectations. It will help mitigate the risks of big changes down the line. Although you can always adjust the scope as planning continues, if you need to. Once you understand your project scope, you want to document all the details so that anyone can refer back to it throughout the life cycle of the project. We'll talk about some best practices for that at the end of this module. Let's recap. A clearly defined scope describes all the details of a project and regulates what can be added or removed as it progresses. 
while it's ultimately the project manager's responsibility to monitor the project and make sure all the work and resources fall within its scope, team members and stakeholders can be encouraged to do their part by focusing on the tasks that are the most important to reaching the project's goal. The next video talks about the concepts of in scope and out of scope and the phenomenon called scope creep. All three will help with ensuring your project stays on track and within budget. Stay tuned. Hi there. As you now know, an important part of project management is keeping an eye on your project scope and knowing which tasks are truly part of the plan and which aren't. Tasks that are included in the project and contribute to the project's overall goal are considered to be in scope. Tasks that aren't included are called out of scope. It's your job as a project manager to set and maintain firm boundaries for your project so that your team can stay on track. For example, if the copywriters or designers of the Plant Pals catalog came up with the idea to expand the type of plants being offered to top customers, you would have to point out that their suggestion is out of scope and would take extra time and add to your budget costs. As you progress through the project lifecycle, you're going to encounter unexpected challenges or have new details or ideas brought to your attention that could impact your project's success. Changes, growth, and uncontrolled factors that affect a project's scope at any point after the project begins are referred to as scope creep. Scope creep is a common problem and it's not always easy to control. It's one that we struggle with on every single project. It can happen on any project in any industry. Imagine you're working in a tech company and your project involves working with designers and engineers to update the language icons design on a mobile keyboard app for a smartphone. While the team is making the update, they realize that the search icon and the voice input icon also need a design refresh. These are very small features and while technically not in scope, the team feels it would take minimal effort and provide lots of value. So they go ahead and make the updates. During a stakeholder review, it's pointed out that there is a keyboard in English, but no keyboards for other languages, and a suggestion is made to design additional keyboards. At this point, the project scope is in danger of expanding from a fairly simple icon update to a complex rollout of multiple keyboard layouts. Adding the keyboards would impact the team's timelines, causing the project to take longer to finish. It would also impact resourcing because you would need to hire more people or existing team members would have to work overtime. And it would increase the budget since the team did not anticipate costs for extra working hours or keyboard translations. This is just one example of scope creep. Sometimes it's subtle just design one or two more icons. Or more obvious, hey, can you tack on designing keyboards for other languages? By identifying scope creep and being proactive, you protect your project and your project team. To help you combat scope creep, it's good to know that there are two major sources from which it comes, external and internal. External sources of scope creep are easier to recognize for example, if you're working on a project with one main customer, the customer might request changes, or the business environment around you might shift, or the underlying technology you're using might change. While you can't control everything that happens, there are some useful tips to keep in mind. First, make sure the stakeholders have visibility into the project. You want them to know the details of what's going to be produced what resources are required, how much it will cost, and how much time it'll take. Also, get clarity on the requirements and ask for constructive criticism of the initial product proposal. It's important to get this information before any contracts are signed. Be sure to set ground rules and expectations for stakeholder involvement once the project gets started. Come to an agreement on each of your roles and responsibilities during execution and status reviews. Once you're clear on the project scope, come up with a plan for how to deal with out-of-scope requests. 
agree on who can make formal change requests and how those requests will be evaluated, accepted, and performed. And finally, be sure to get these agreements in writing. This way, you always have a documentation to point to if you, a stakeholder, or the customer have a disagreement down the line. One of the leading causes of external scope creep is not being clear on the requirements before defining the scope and getting formal approval to move forward with the project. This is where those specific and measurable goals and deliverables come into play. If the requirements aren't specific, and if you haven't agreed on the project's processes, deliverables, and milestones, then you're almost guaranteed to be dealing with scope creep once the project begins. Internal sources of scope creep are trickier to spot and harder to control. This kind of creep comes from members of the project team who suggest or even insist on process or product changes or improvements. It's possible that a product developer will justify a decision on the grounds of making the product better, even though it's going to cost more. Or a team lead might decide that a certain process is more efficient without realizing the impact the change in process will have on other team members tasked with different parts of the project. What you need to make clearer to your team is that any change outside of the project scope comes off the bottom line, threatens the schedule, and increases risk. There are no small impacts to project scope. Anytime a team member takes on an unplanned task, more is lost than just the time spent working on that task. It's your responsibility as the project manager to maintain the limits of the project. The best defense is to know the details of your project in and out so you always prepared with the most appropriate response to a new idea or request. Let's recap. Monitor your project scope and protect it at all costs. Even the most minor change can mean major risk to your project's success. Coming up, I'll tell you about the triple constraint model and how you can use it to help determine how your project changes affect scope. Stay tuned. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about managing project scope. Managing scope goes hand in hand with goal setting. For example, redefining the scope can change the goal and a revision of the goal can change the scope. The concept of project scope is important throughout the project. While your project will have its own specific goals, the overall goal for you as the project manager is to deliver the project according to the scope agreements. This includes delivering the project within the given deadline and the approved budget. You'll quickly find that this is easier said than done. As you progress through your project, you will continually need to make compromises and weigh trade-offs as new challenges and changes and factors present themselves. Anytime a team member takes on an unplanned task, more is lost than just the time spent working on that task. In order to decide if a scope change is acceptable and what impact it will have, project managers usually refer to the triple constraint model. The triple constraint model is the combination of the three most significant restrictions of any project, scope, time, and cost. We've talked a bit about what scope is, so let's focus now on time and cost. Time refers to the project schedule and deadlines. Cost includes the budget, and it also covers resources and the people who will work on the project. Both time and budget have to be carefully managed alongside scope. All three of these are linked. You can't change one without having an impact on the others. For example, a decrease in cost means a change in time or scope. An increase in time means a change in scope or cost, or both. Understanding how changing one impacts the other two constraints is key. It's important to consider what trade-offs you're willing to make as the project progresses. To do this successfully, you need a clear understanding of the project priorities. You have to know what is most important when it comes to scope, time, and cost. If there's a specific deadline that must be met, then you'll need to limit any changes to the scope that might cause the project to go past the deadline. If the product must look or function in a certain way, then the requirements are a priority. 
and you could justify changes in costs or time in order to meet the scope requirements. But just because you can make a change, that doesn't mean you necessarily should make a change. And even though the limits of scope, time, and costs have been set, you can still make changes if there's a good reason to do so. Don't worry, you won't have to decide on these changes all by yourself. If there are scope decisions that need to be made, the project manager will likely need to consult with the project sponsor and stakeholders to get their approvals. Let's go through a few scenarios so you can get familiar with weighing the value of a trade-off and understanding the impacts of any changes. In the first scenario, a request has been made to improve the Plant Pals product features. The director of product at Office Green wants to use pots that indicate when the plants need to be watered. Making changes to the product is a scope change. You know that you can't change the budget, but you can extend the timeline. So you can accept the scope change request and extend the timeline as long as the budget doesn't increase. Here's another possible scenario. A request has been made to reduce the budget without making any changes to the scope. The final outcome of Plant Pal still needs to look and function as you all originally agreed. If you're going to reduce the budget and keep the scope, you may need to extend the timeline. Okay, here's another scenario. There's a request to tighten up the timeline and finish early, but you can't increase the budget. In order to do this, you need to make changes to the scope, like limiting shipping options. Doing this will give your project more time because you'll have one less shipping contract to negotiate. The end result won't be exactly what was originally agreed on, but it means getting it out earlier as requested and within budget. Let's try one more. In this last scenario, the director of product informs you that the project deadline must be met. It's the most important thing. In this case, your stakeholders are willing to increase the budget and make any necessary changes to the scope requirements in order to meet the deadline. In the end, it's all about prioritizing which element of the triangle matters the most in the project. Are you getting the hang of trade-offs? Keeping in mind scope, time, and costs as you manage a project will help you navigate different conditions while still achieving your goals. Remember, change is inevitable when managing projects. And understanding this framework can set you up to plan and communicate accordingly so your project will succeed. When you understand the triple constraint model, you'll have the tools to evaluate scope changes. Understanding how changes will be evaluated, accepted, and perform is key to scope management. Don't worry if you still have questions. We'll be sure to talk more about this concept in course four. Up next, we'll talk more about successfully launching and landing your project. See you soon. Hi, I'm Tori and I'm an education program manager at Google. Specifically, I work on our digital literacy curriculum called Applied Digital Skills that helps learners of all ages learn the practical digital skills needed for the jobs of today and tomorrow. So scope is important because if you have a well-defined scope in the beginning of a project, it'll help make sure that your team members, your stakeholders are all aligned and on the same page right from the start and you can avoid any issues down the line um, that may come up that you might not have been aware of. Some challenges of staying within scope could be what we like to call scope creep. And these things can happen if, for example, you have some stakeholders that have some certain needs, desires, or requests that may actually end up changing the scope. Scope creep is when the scope changes after you've already started the project. And this can be really challenging to manage if you don't keep an eye on it from the beginning. I was recently working on a project where we were hoping to actually reach underserved communities with our digital literacy curriculum. And the initial project scope started off focusing on middle and high school students. But at some point down the line after the project started, there were some stakeholders who actually wanted to expand the audience to adult learners. And so we had some trouble 
trying to figure out how we were gonna manage that. Were we going to change the scope? Were we gonna keep it the same? And ultimately we decided to keep the scope the same and referenced back to our original goal in the beginning. Because if you think about it, changing the audience would make the project goals and our strategies for reaching those audiences drastically different. Um, so ultimately we ended up keeping the scope and communicating that to our stakeholders. Some best practices for managing scope is just make sure you document everything in the beginning and share it with all of your stakeholders and team members and make sure everybody's in agreement on that scope. There are times where the scope may need to change and that's okay, but you have to be able to make sure that you can also change and potentially change your timeline, your resources, or even the budget to accommodate that scope change. Welcome back. At this point, you've learned a bit about setting SMART goals along with defining and managing the scope. It may be tempting to think that you're ready to kick off this project with these two important pieces, but there is one common element that ensures you'll achieve these goals within scope. And that key element is knowing when your project is delivered and you can call it a success. Many people think the time to decide if a project is successful is when you've produced the final outcome and presented it to the client. That's getting close. Delivering the final result of your project to the client or user, it's what's called a project launch. You finish building or creating a project, the tasks are completed, and the deliverables are done. You've hit your goal. The project is successful and consider complete in that sense. But does it work well? Did it achieve your desired outcome? The real deciding factor of project success is when you put the final outcome to the test. Landing is when you actually measure the success of your project using the success criteria established at the outset of the project. This is a crucial part of goal setting that is often overlooked in the initiation phase. For example, think about taking a trip on an airplane. It's not enough for the pilot to be able to get the plane off the ground. To arrive safely at your destination, they've got to know how to land. Your success has to continue beyond the point of delivering the final project. You need to be able to measure whether the project functions as intended once it's put into practice. Let's take the example of your project plant pals. You've managed to launch the new service with success. The website has launched, the catalogs have been printed and delivered, orders have been received, and revenue is starting to go up. It would be easy to call this a win and move on, but what happens if the customers are unhappy once the plants are delivered? What if the plants start to wilt and discolor after a couple of weeks? Just because launching the project and getting it out the door looks like success on paper, that doesn't mean the project has managed to land. For most projects, a launch itself isn't a meaningful measure of success. It's what comes after the launch that really counts. Launches are only a means to an end, and looking beyond the launch is important to ensure the launch achieves your overall goals. If you start off looking beyond the launch to the landing, you're more likely to get where you're trying to go. Since landing is a concept and not a finite definition, it's important to define what a successful landing looks like for a particular project. Luckily, we have a way to measure and help you ensure the success of your project. It's called success criteria. And if you can manage to follow it through the life cycle of your project, you'll ultimately have a smooth landing. The success criteria includes all the specific details of your goals and deliverables. And it can be a guide so you know whether you've accomplished what you set out to do. Success criteria will set the standards for how your project will be judged. In the next video, I'll outline what you need to know about defining success criteria and communicating project success. See you in a bit. Hello again. We've learned about the differences between launching and landing. And we've also learned about the differences between delivering your project and finding out if the outcome performs as expected. But how exactly do you know that your project is a success? How do you know if you've actually landed? At the beginning of the project, 
you define goals and deliverables that are measurable, meaning that you can determine if they were met. Similarly, you need to define success criteria that can also be measured, so you'll know whether they were met. The success criteria will tell you whether or not the project as a whole was successful. They are the specific details of your goals and deliverables that tell you whether you've accomplished what you set out to do. They are the standards by which the project will be judged once it's been delivered to stakeholders and customers. Defining success criteria also clarifies for your team what they're trying to accomplish beyond just launching something to users. Is it to increase customer satisfaction with the service so they can continue to purchase more products? Enhance an existing feature to retain customers? Depending on the project, the answers will be different. But it's important that a team is aligned and working towards a shared goal. Sometimes forcing the conversation and clarifying what the end result looks like can bring to light questions and areas of disagreement. There isn't a set process for determining success criteria, but I'll break down a couple of key points to consider. Remember the measurable part of your SMART goals? One of the questions to ask when making your goals measurable is how will I know when it is accomplished? The same question applies to your project. How will you know when it's done? Only in this case, you want to ask, how will I know when it's successfully accomplished? You can measure to determine your project success in a similar way to measuring a goal. So go through your project goals and deliverables, review the scope, and identify the measurable aspects of your project. These are going to be any of the metrics used in the goals and deliverables along with your budget and schedule details. Another thing you'll need to do is get clarity from stakeholders on the project requirements and expectations. This is key. There are lots of people involved with any project, and that means lots of ideas about what success looks like to each person. You want to ask questions such as, who ultimately says whether or not the project is successful? What criteria will be measured to determine success? What's the success of this project based on? Once you've collected clarifying information, document and share all of it so that you, your team, and your stakeholders can refer to it later. Let's try creating success criteria with the Office Green project. For example, the goal is to increase revenue by 5% by the end of the year. One of the deliverables is a website with a gallery of the different plan selections that are offered. It's not enough just to make a list of criteria. You need a process for measuring success from start to finish throughout the entire project life cycle. This way, you can make adjustments and ensure success by the time you're ready to land. There are many metrics you can use, and for some products, it will make sense to use more than one. The metrics you choose should be as closely aligned to your project's goal as possible. For example, happiness metrics measure user attitudes and satisfaction, or perceived ease of use, and you can measure these through surveys. For the Plant Pals project, we may consider a customer satisfaction rate of 85% within the first three months of launching as a way to measure success. You can also consider customer adoption and engagement metrics along with more business-oriented metrics that track things like sales and growth. Adoption refers to how the customer uses and adopts a product or service without any issues. Engagement refers to how often or meaningful customer interaction and participation is over time. Adoption metrics might include launching a new product to a group of users and having a high amount of them use or adopt it. Engagement metrics might include increasing the daily usage of a design feature or increasing orders and customer interactions. Using the office screen example, tracking how many customers initially sign up for and use the Plant Pal service is an adoption metric. Tracking how many customers renew their Plant Pal service, post about it, or share feedback are engagement metrics. Once you've defined the metrics that you'll be measuring, think about how you track these metrics. 
Evaluate which tools can help you collect the data you need to ensure you're staying on track. For example, if you're measuring business metrics like revenue, consider tracking that in a spreadsheet or dashboard where you can easily spot gaps and trends. If you're measuring customer satisfaction, you can think of a way to incentivize customers to participate in regular email surveys and create a system to measure their responses when they participate. You can also utilize your project management tools to check on efficiency metrics, like what percent of tasks are completed or whether the project is progressing alongside the planned timelines. It's smart to measure success with your team as a project or product is in progress. For example, you can hold a project review once a month, have team members complete task checklists by certain deadlines, or hold live feedback sessions with your users or customers. There are many different ways to measure success. The key is to pick the methods that work best for your success criteria. It's a good idea that, along with each success criteria on your list, to also include the methods for how success will be measured, how often it's measured, and who's responsible for measuring it. Share your success criteria document with your stakeholders and ask if they agree with how the project's success will be determined. It's also a good idea to have the appropriate stakeholders sign off on the success criteria. This way, everyone will be clear on who is responsible for which tasks and you'll all thoroughly understand what the path to success entails. Keep this documentation visible throughout the duration of the project and clearly communicate it with your team every step of the way. They're the ones who will be attempting to meet all the different requirements, so don't keep them in the dark about what they're supposed to do or how they're supposed to do it. If done correctly, defining your success criteria should create greater alignment within the team and give everybody better visibility into how to achieve success. Clarity around success metrics also helps teams prioritize which efforts are most impactful to their users. Defining project success is a complex but crucial part of project management. With more and more practice, this process will come more natural to you in the planning stages and throughout your project. We'll continue exploring and talking more about these concepts throughout the course. Nice job, you're almost done with module two. I'll see you in a bit to review what we've covered. You're doing great. You've completed this module and have set yourself up for success. Way to go. Defining goals and managing scope and ensuring a successful landing might seem tricky to master at first, but the SMART method and the triple constraint triangle, tools and methods for measuring success criteria, and clear communication will help you every step of the way. In the next module, we will talk about the roles and responsibilities that come along with each project so that everyone knows how they contribute to reaching the project's goals. Welcome back. In this module, we'll learn all about stakeholders and their importance to a project. In the last set of videos, you learn the ins and outs of project scope. While exploring how a project can be in scope or out of scope, you learned about setting SMART goals we also discussed launching a project, getting it started versus landing a project, whether or not it was successful. And there are a lot more exciting topics to come. In this module, you'll learn more about stakeholders. Remember that stakeholders play a pivotal role. They are people who are interested in and affected by the project's completion and success. You'll see that each person involved has a set role and set responsibilities to help bring the project to a landing. Those roles include project sponsors, customers, team members, and of course, you, the project manager. You'll also find out about things like stakeholder mapping and analysis and RACI charts. These are tools that help clarify roles and responsibilities and prevent confusion on who takes ownership of which tasks. Throughout this module, you'll have plenty of hands-on activities, discussion prompts, and readings to really help you master how to start a project. As we go through each new skill, imagine checking off a to-do list. 
There's almost nothing more satisfying than crossing off a to-do. Hello, nice to meet you. My name is Holly, and I will be your accessibility instructor for this course. Accessibility should be incorporated into every role at a company, whether a product designer, communicator, developer, or yes, project manager. In my role of accessibility education program manager at Google, I help ensure all Googlers are educated on accessibility, from building accessible products for the entire world to communicating accessibility with you throughout this course. I'm deaf myself, so I am able to share my experiences as a person with a disability too, and help others understand that having a disability isn't a barrier in itself. It's the world around us that we must strive to make accessible for everyone. Accessibility can be defined a number of different ways. To me, it means actively removing any barriers that might prevent persons with disabilities from being able to access technology, information, or experiences, and leveling the playing field so everyone has an equal chance of enjoying life and being successful. A disability is often defined as a physical or mental condition that substantially limits a major life activity, such as walking, talking, seeing, hearing, or learning. Over one billion people in the world have a disability. One billion. That's more than the population of the United States, Canada, France, Italy, Japan, Mexico, and Brazil combined. Disability is diverse and intersectional. Someone can be born with a condition or acquire it later in life. Disability can affect us all in some way, whether directly or indirectly, and at any time from permanent, like deafness, to temporary, like a broken leg, to situational, like trying to operate a TV remote control in the dark. When you create solutions for persons with disabilities, you are not only serving the critical audience of people with permanent disabilities, you are also unlocking secondary benefits for everyone who may move in and out of disability over time. As you progress through this course, it's also important to keep in mind your fellow classmates Setting the expectation that you'll be interacting with others that learn and work differently is a key strength of working with accessibility in mind. Asking others what they need from you to learn and communicate, and also sharing what you need if you have a disability yourself, is important to working well together as a team. In project management, you yourself, people on your project team, or people highly invested in your project may have a disability, whether visible or invisible. As a project manager, you are responsible for making sure a group of people can come together to achieve a common goal using shared tools and systems. In order to be successful, you need to make sure the infrastructure and culture you set up works for everyone. Knowing this is a key element of project management, I'll teach you how to make your work and content accessible. I'll also help you become a better project manager by considering accessibility in your future projects. I'll offer tips and best practices throughout the program, starting with this one. Did you know that many technologies that we all enjoy started out as an accessibility feature? Think about the Google Assistant, which allows you to control your home with your voice, or closed captioning, which makes it possible to watch the TV above a crowded noisy bar. By considering accessibility, you can impact everyone's lives for the better. I'm excited to share more with you throughout the program while you learn more about project management and prepare for a career in this field. See you later. In this video, I'll take you through the process of choosing the roles and responsibilities of all the people on your project team. In order to decide who does what on a project, we have to consider and outline our needs. Choosing the right people for a team is a big task and one every project manager should take seriously. After all, these are the people who do the work on the project, so we want to make sure we have the right people lined up. When identifying people resources, we need to carefully consider the project needs and use that info to guide our decision making. First, a project manager will make a list of roles that they'll need on their team to complete each task. In the same way that a project manager is accountable for the overall initiation, planning, execution, and completion of a project, the person in each role is accountable for specific tasks within the project lifecycle. For example, 
a home construction project team might include roles on their list like an architect, a site manager, and multiple construction workers. Once the tasks are clearly laid out, the project manager decides how many people they'll need on their team. This can vary greatly depending on the project size. For small projects, a team may only need three or four people to complete the deliverables on time. And for larger projects, a team might include dozens. At Google, we sometimes have hundreds of Googlers working on the same project. Getting the team size right is important for a bunch of reasons. For example, when there's a lot of people on a project, communication sometimes becomes difficult. That makes it more likely for someone to miss important details. But if your team is too small, there might not be enough people to finish all the tasks. Once you know how many people you need on your team, you have to think about who does what. To decide on the right person for each role, a project manager needs to think carefully about skills. Makes sense, right? If you're managing the construction of a house, you want to know that the construction workers who are building the frame or installing the drywall have the skills needed to do it properly. It's on the project manager to ensure that everyone on the team has the right skills to do the job. But it's also important to remember that skills can be taught. If someone doesn't have a certain skill initially, they might still be a great fit for the team. Maybe this person brings a positive attitude and attention to detail. Perfectly good reasons to have them on your team. Just keep in mind that if a teammate doesn't have the necessary skills, it's important that they are trained in time so not to cause project delays. When choosing teammates, a project manager also has to factor in each person's availability and whether they'll feel motivated to complete their assigned tasks. For example, you might know a fantastic site manager who'd make a great asset to the team. But if they're already staffed on another big project, they might not have the time to commit to yours. Or even if they do have the time, they might not feel like this project will give them the visibility they need for a promotion. Motivation is a key ingredient to great work. So it's a good idea to pick people who are excited to get involved. But of course, we don't always get to choose our resources. Sometimes another manager or team lead might just assign people to roles. When this happens, it's the project manager's challenge to deliver the best work with what we're given. Let's check in on our project at Office Screen, where we're rolling out a new service. As a project manager, it's up to you to decide who you need on your team. You have to ask yourself questions on things like staff experience, availability, the workspace, team member workload on other projects, and more. For example, who on the team has office landscaping experience? Who's local to the city where the launch will happen? Who can be fully dedicated to this project for the next eight weeks? There's no exact formula for putting together the right team, which makes it a little tricky Every situation is different and calls for a different set of skills, experience, and perspectives. It can be helpful to look deeper into each task on the project. Always ask yourself these key questions. How many people do I need on my team each step of the way? Which team members do I need and when? Are those experts already busy on other projects? Who makes the final decisions on project resources? So there's a lot to think about when putting together your dream team. Up next, we'll learn more about all the different roles on a project. See you there. As we mentioned in the last video, when you're managing a project to meet certain goals, having the right team around you is a must. Why is it so important? It's because there can be so many moving parts on a project. That means you really need to have confidence and trust that the people around you have the skills and motivation to do the work well. To feel confident in your team, you need to know each person's role from the start. Clearly laying out the responsibilities for each role helps everyone know what project tasks they're accountable for. 
odds are you can't complete this project on your own. Even if you're the best project manager of all time, which we know you will be. Before we jump into the specific roles on a project, we want to call out that some roles aren't fixed. Sometimes team members need to adapt and take on more than one role at a time. This usually happens if the company is small or resources are limited. For example, at a small firm, you might be the project manager, designer, and marketer. Whether they're fixed or not, we always have these project roles, project sponsors, team members, customers or users, stakeholders, and of course, the project manager. Let's learn more about each of them. A project sponsor is the person who's accountable for the project and who ensures the project delivers the agreed upon value to the business. They play a vital leadership role throughout the process. Sometimes they fund the project. The sponsor will probably communicate directly with managers and key stakeholders. Team members are the heart of the operation. They're the people doing the day-to-day -day work and making the project happen. The customers are the people who will get some sort of value from a successfully landed project. Since the project aims to deliver something useful to the customers, the customer's needs usually define the project's requirements. You can think of them as the buyers of the project. In some situations, we have both customers and users for a project, and we need to differentiate between the two. Simply put, users are the people that ultimately use the product that your project will produce. To make the distinction nice and clear for you, think of it this way. A software company has created a type of software that allows teams to communicate with each other in an instant message application. The software is purchased by Corporation ABC. They are the customer. But the users are everyone within Corporation ABC that will be using the instant message application every day. Stakeholders are anyone involved in the project. Those who have a vested interest in the project's success. Primary stakeholders are people who expect to benefit directly from the project's completion while secondary stakeholders play an intermediary role and are indirectly impacted by the project. Secondary stakeholders may be contractors or members of a partner organization, but both primary and secondary stakeholders help project managers define project goals and outcomes. And finally, we can't forget the project manager, the person who plans, organizes, and oversees the whole project. That's you. Let's now plug these roles into our Office Screen project. Recall that Office Screen is a commercial plant company that does interior landscaping and plant design for offices and other commercial businesses. We're launching our new plant service. So if you recall our SMART goal, which must be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound, is to roll out a new service to provide office plants to top clients by the end of the year. There's a lot to do when launching a new service. Plants need to be ordered and delivered every few days. New clients will need to be familiarized with Office Screen and its procedures. And there will be ongoing updates to the website and app. For Office Screen's launch, our project sponsor is the director of product. They approve the project's budget and ensure that everything stays aligned to the vision, which in this case, is that inexpensive and easy to maintain live plants are provided in order to improve the employee work environments. The team's made up of people from across departments and they're all working together to support the project. For example, the marketing department has assigned some people to the team because they'll need to tell customers about this new service. On this project, the landscape designer is also the website designer. This is an example of where a team member plays more than one role. And you, you're the project manager. You're the one managing the information, people, and schedule to carry this project to a successful landing. Our customers for this project are buyers at offices who might be interested in Office Green services, such as office managers or procurement teams. 
However, the users are the employees who work at the offices because they're the ones who enjoy the plants. And finally, all of these people are project stakeholders. Secondary stakeholders won't play active roles throughout all phases of the project, but still need to be informed as they are a component of what the project needs to succeed. For example, these include Office Green's investors who are helping to fund the new service launch and the Office Green receptionist who will answer a lot of customer questions about the new service once it's launched. So now that we know why it's so important to decide on these roles early on and how these roles work within a project, let's put them into action. My name is John Flatley, and I'm a technical program manager for Google in the Chicago office. I've worked at a couple different companies. I've worked at startups, I've worked at growth stage companies, and I've worked at Google. And what I've found is that some companies, what you find is that there's engineers that kind of come in, and what they're looking for is direction. They want to be told what to do. They want to be handed the task and, and, and just uh, execute on it. At Google, people are really invested in their product. We call Google a bottom-up kind of culture. You know, a lot of co companies, you have this directive from the top saying, this is what we're going to do. But at Google, people are so passionate about the industry and what they're working on that the ideas really come up and bubble up from the bottom. What I always tell folks is that the technical and hard skills of program management, you can pick up in a book. You can learn about agile. You can learn about extreme programming. You can learn about all these things, planning, retrospectives, all these great terms and tools and stuff like that. At the end of the day, that's all they are, though. They're just a tool. And you can't use a hammer for a screw. It's the same thing with program management. You can't use the same tools for every project. You have to learn what's going on in a given team, a given project, and a given group of people. And so at the end of the day, really the challenge is, is understanding the dynamics of the people that you work with. I like to say that the key about program management is people and context. You have to understand the people that you're working with. You have to understand the context. And only then can you apply the skills that you learned you won't always have the, ch the opportunity to pick and choose what people you want to work on a project. And that's okay because, you know, you can just use those tools that you've gained in the past to understand the backgrounds and the style and the personalities of the people that you're working with. The most important part about program management is understand the personalities of the people you work with so that you can tailor your approach to make sure that you're working effectively with them. Think about it this way. You might be working with an introverted person. That person needs different types of attention than an extroverted person. An extroverted person wants to talk about their ideas and their project plans in a meeting. An introverted person, you might want to get their feedback offline or have an async kind of uh, form or opportunity for them to voice their opinion. It's really not going to be cut and dry every time you work on a project. And that's why it's really, really important that you're flexible in your approach. You want to have people that are you know, challenging the, the choices that we make. But at the end of the day, we all need to agree on a common goal and a common vision so that we can move forward. We don't want distractions because that's the thing that, the one thing that can slow things down. You know, at the end of the day, technical problems aren't that hard. People problems are really hard. And making sure that your team is sold and bought in on a vision and the project is super, super important. It's your goal and your job role as a program manager to motivate the team and make sure that everyone's on the same page. We just saw how important stakeholders are to the project and how both primary and secondary stakeholders help project managers define project goals and outcomes. As a quick refresher, primary stakeholders are people who will benefit directly from the project's success, while secondary stakeholders are indirectly impacted by the project's success. Having all these different people involved on a project can get confusing and that's where stakeholder analysis comes in handy. This is a visual representation of all the stakeholders. It helps you avoid surprises, build necessary partnerships, and ensure you're involving the right people at the right time. When done well, your stakeholder analysis helps you see all the opportunities for success and the potential risks. It illustrates which stakeholders are taking on which responsibilities and it can help you include the right people in important conversations, which is key to getting the support you need throughout the project. There are three key steps to kicking off a stakeholder analysis. First, make a list of all the stakeholders that the project impacts. Then, determine the level of interest and influence for each stakeholder 
And finally, assess their ability to participate and find ways to involve them. In the second step, we talk about influence and interest. What do those terms mean here? Influence measures how much power a stakeholder has and how much the stakeholder's actions affect the project outcome. In our office screen example, the director of product who first initiated the project and oversees new products and services has a huge amount of influence, while the vendor providing the greenery has less influence. Interest is pretty much what it sounds like. How much are the needs of the stakeholder affected by project operations and outcomes? For example, Office Green's Human Resources Department might not have as much interest in the product launch as the sales department does. The power grid is a super useful two by two grid used for conducting a stakeholder analysis. We use the power grid to assign each stakeholder's level of importance to the project, measuring their interest and influence. The position of the stakeholder on the grid usually determines their active role in the project. The higher the interest and influence, the more important the stakeholder is to the project's success. Without their support, it's unlikely that the project will successfully land. These people are our key stakeholders. Now that you have a better idea of each stakeholder's position on the team, you can plan how to best manage everyone. There are four different techniques you can use for managing stakeholders. The first group of stakeholders are the key players or key stakeholders. You find these people in the top right corner of the grid. To best manage key stakeholders, you want to closely partner with them to reach the desired outcomes. Of course, not everyone's a key stakeholder, but each role even the non-key stakeholder gets a spot on the grid. You find stakeholders with higher influence but lower interest in the top left corner of the grid. To manage these stakeholders, you want to consult with them and meet their needs. Their opinions and input are important to the project. The director of product has high influence but may not be vested into day-to-day -day activities and therefore will have a lower interest. Stakeholders with lower influence but high interest are in the bright bottom corner of the grid. For these stakeholders, you want to show consideration for them by keeping them up to date on the project. It's unlikely they'll need a say in what's going on, but keeping them informed is important. For example, the customer success team may have lower influence but high interest since they'll work directly with clients on the new product. Last up, we have stakeholders with low influence and low interest. You'll find these in the bottom left corner. They're the least important of the stakeholders, but this doesn't mean that they don't matter. It might just be that for this particular project, they aren't as integral. So for this project, you mainly want to monitor them, keeping them in the know. Creating a grid like this is an effective way to track who should be communicated with and when. This grid here is an example of how that might play out, depending on the project and the stakeholders. You may also want to create a steering committee made up of high influence and high interest stakeholders. These people will be the most senior decision making body on any project. They have the authority to make changes to budget and approve updates to timeline or scope. The project manager isn't a member of the committee but they're responsible for bringing the right project information to the steering committee so that decisions can be quickly made. How you engage your stakeholders from this point on depends on your particular situation. There are different ways to involve each stakeholder, and you have to be strategic to get helpful and relevant input from the right people at the right time. You want to meet with some stakeholders every single day, and others you'll just send periodic updates to. Stakeholder buy-in is the process of involving these people in decision-making to hopefully reach a broader consensus on the organization's future. To get stakeholders to buy-in on the project, you will have to pay particular attention to your high-impact stakeholders and make sure they feel looped in. You want to explain to them how the project will help them achieve their goals. 
and you'll want to have their support later on if any issues come up. Here are some important things to keep in mind when communicating with stakeholders. If you have one main stakeholder, that stakeholder is likely to be highly influential and needs constant communication. But if you're on a larger project with numerous stakeholders, they won't be quite as involved in the day-to-day -day tasks. For stakeholders who need time to make decisions about the project, over-communicate early on. For example, hold frequent meetings and send daily end-of-day progress emails. This way, they have enough time to weigh the options and make decisions. Think about the level of project details each stakeholder needs. You don't want to spend time diving deep with stakeholders that just need a project summary. For example, the facilities team that delivers the product doesn't need daily updates on vendor pricing or website issues. On the flip side, do spend time updating key members that need frequent updates. The sales team will need to know pricing and availability changes, so a weekly check-in might make sense here. Great work. You just completed your own stakeholder analysis. Up next, we'll check out another tool, RACI charting. See you there. In the last video, we saw how a stakeholder analysis shows us how to best work with stakeholders and when to communicate with all the different people involved in the project. In this video, we're going to check out another handy tool called a RACI chart. A RACI chart helps to define roles and responsibilities for individuals or teams to ensure work gets done efficiently. It creates clear roles and gives direction for each team member. There are four types of participation included in a RACI chart. These are responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. Let's take a look at each. Responsible refers to those doing the work to complete the task. Accountable refers to those making sure the work gets done. Consulted includes those giving feedback, like subject matter experts or decision makers. And lastly, we have informed, which includes those just needing to know the final decisions or that a task is complete. Here's an image of how this breaks down in a chart form. When creating your RACI chart, you will need to write down each task or deliverable for your project and then assign it the appropriate role for each stakeholder. To do this, first think about who's involved in the project. Write the roles or people's name in a row across the top of your chart. Pro tip, use roles rather than names if some people might take on more than one role. Next. Write down the tasks or deliverables in a column on the left. Try not to get too specific here. You want the chart to be simple and easy to read. After that, go through each task and deliverable and ask who's responsible for doing this? Who's accountable if it doesn't get done? Who will have strong opinions to add and therefore should be consulted about how this gets done? And who needs to be informed of the progress or decisions made about this. Assign the letters R, A, C, and I based on your answers. For example, as a project manager on Office Screen's new service launch, one of your tasks is to create different price points for different packages and delivery frequencies. The head of finance will be accountable because the project needs to stay in budget and make money but it's the financial analyst who's responsible, as they're the person doing the work in determining optimal pricing. The director of product will be consulted on the matter as they oversee the product offerings. And finally, team members like those on the sales team need to be informed of the final pricing. It's possible there are several roles that fall into the informed and consulted categories. One thing that will always remain constant is there will never be more than one person designated as accountable. This prevents confusion because having one person accountable clearly defines ownership. However, 
the same person that is accountable may also be responsible. There are several other factors that can cause role confusion. For example, there might be unbalanced workloads, which means some people might be doing more work or less work than others on the team. Or there could be an unclear hierarchy when people aren't sure who to seek help from if a task doesn't get done. Or unclear ownership of decisions where people aren't sure who makes the final call on a project. Another issue could be overlapping work. This is when teams or individuals feel that they're responsible for the same work. When this happens, things can get confusing fast and the same goes for excessive communication. While communication is usually a good thing, too much communication can actually make things more complicated. It can cause information overload where people don't know what to pay attention to and so they miss something important. Wow, there's a lot of things that might cause confusion, but all these issues can be resolved or even prevented with a RACI analysis. Be proactive and do this work up front, and you'll help ensure the success of your project. If something is stumping you or you feel stuck at a certain aspect, there's always someone else who's going through the same thing. Anytime I started to feel overwhelmed by information or like I just wasn't getting it, I wasted so much time being unsure of myself that I should have just Listen to my friends and family when they said, just do it, you can do it. One of the greatest uh, things that helped me to get back motivated is the accessibility of the course. On my phone, I was just able to go into the app and listen to a few videos because I can learn on the go. Having a network of people that motivates you, it's so fundamental. You know, even if it's a friend or if it's a family member, that you can get from the beginning and it can be there for you on your corner like a coach. And don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it be from your peers, from your coaches, friends, family. There's always someone who knows more and you can learn from them. Kudos, you finished another module. That was a fun one. We covered a lot of topics that were likely new to you. So let's recap. In our first video, we checked out each individual role associated with projects. You learned that as a project manager, you'll have to ask yourself key questions to make sure you build a successful team. You have to consider things like team size, necessary skills, availability, and motivation. Then you completed a stakeholder analysis. This helps you understand how you might manage communication with each person on the project. Next came the RACI chart, which define rules and responsibilities for individuals or teams. This helps people get work done efficiently, and it creates clear lanes and instruction for each team member to operate within. It does this by assigning which roles are responsible, accountable, informed, and consulted. Overall, you learn some really useful concrete tools to help you stay organized throughout the project. You can use these charts as you work with your stakeholders. And if your project is ever evolving, as some are, stakeholder mapping and RACI charting will help you stay on top of the tasks and communicate effectively. In the next module, you'll learn about other useful resources for managing projects and discover how to know which tool to use when. See you soon. Welcome back and congrats on completing that graded assessment. In the previous module, you learned all about project roles and responsibilities and we introduce you to some tools that you can use to ensure team accountability, like stakeholder analysis and RACI charts. Coming up, we'll talk about project tools and resources and the value of documentation. By the end of this module, you'll understand the types of resources available to a project manager. You'll be able to document information in a formal project charter, and you'll be able to compare and use various project management tools. Ready to get started? Meet me in the next video. So far, you've learned how to determine project goals and scope, and how to identify the right stakeholders for a project. Now it's time to add another important ingredient, resources. As a project manager, understanding your resource needs is crucial to achieving your goals. 
So during the initiation phase, it's important to ask yourself, what are the things we still need to acquire in order to complete our project? Project resources usually include budget, people, and materials. You'll use tools to manage all those resources. As you think about the goals and the scope of the project, you figure out the different resources you'll need to meet those goals. It's important to figure out your resources before the project gets rolling. This makes it easy for everyone on your team to get their work done. And that's your job as a project manager. You won't be doing the work directly, but you'll support the people who do. Figuring out resources early on also helps you avoid accidentally understaffing your project, which can seriously slow down team progress and eat away at the overall timeline. Even worse, if you're not careful with your resource planning, you could wind up underestimating the budget, meaning you might not have enough money to purchase necessary materials, hire vendors, or support overtime requests. Planning your resources early is a great way to set your team up for success. Because when your teammates have what they need to do their work on time and on budget, they're better set up to meet the project's goals. Now let's break down some of the resources that project managers typically work with. First, let's talk about budgets. A budget is an estimate of the amount of money a project will cost to complete. Almost all projects have budgets because they need funding for expenses, like buying the right materials or software, hiring vendors to complete jobs, or doing marketing once the project's done. During the initiation phase, you'll talk to the stakeholders and the people working on the project to figure out the tasks needed to get the project done. Here, you might ask questions to help uncover hidden costs. For example, are there any taxes on products that you need to account for? What about extra fees? All this information will help you create a budget, which you can use to source and compare proposals from vendors, figure out upcoming costs, and track all the money moving in and out of your project. You often include the budget in the project charter and the stakeholders review it for approval. We'll talk more about what goes into creating a project budget and creating a project charter later on. When we talk about resources, we're also talking about the team of people who help execute the tasks of a project. For example, you, as the project manager, are a resource. So is the marketing manager who might create advertisements for this new product. Other resources can include people outside of your company who have unique skills and can do certain tasks that people in your organization can't do personally. Then you have materials. These are items you need to help get the project done. For example, project materials might include the lumber needed to complete a construction project. Okay, so you know that project resources include budget, people, and materials. How do you organize these resources? That's actually a nice transition into our next topic, which is tools. Tools are aids that make it easier for a project manager or team to manage resources and organize work. They help you do things like track tasks, manage budgets, and collaborate with teammates. There are all kinds of tools out there, including productivity tools like Google Docs and work management software like Asana. We'll talk more about these tools later in this program. Tools are essential for tracking progress so you want to keep them top of mind at all phases of your project. Let's talk about how you might determine your resources during the initiation phase of your project at Office Screen. As a reminder, the Plant Pal service offers customers small, low-maintenance plants like cacti and leafy ferns that they can place on their desks. Customers can order them online or from a print catalog, and Office Screen will ship the plants straight to the customer's work address. The project goal is to increase revenue by 5%. So how do you get started? Well, you might do some research to figure out the cost of launching the new plant service. That might include the estimated prices of developing a new website and new promotional materials, as well as shipping and delivery costs. You also might want to budget for specific tools, like a project management software that will help you track progress on this complex project. With that information, you can start to build a realistic budget. And you'll also need to figure out who's working on this project with you. To do this, you might make a list of people and external vendors who will help complete all the project's tasks. For example, 
The person who manages client communications with customers or a new plant supplier that can provide you with your product. Great. Hopefully, you're getting more comfortable with the types of resources you'll need not only to get stuff done, but to achieve your project's goals too. In the next video, we'll talk about documentation, another important topic for anyone who manages projects professionally. By now, you've probably noticed that a big part of project management is guiding decision making. Even if you're not the one making final decisions on major aspects of the project, it's still your job to keep track of every new decision and use those decisions to create a plan. And as you've learned, there are a lot of important decisions to keep track of. That includes everything from identifying project goals and deliverables to choosing the right people to add to a team. It's way too much for any one person to mentally keep track of. It's also important information for everyone on the team to be aware of, not just the project manager. If a decision affects a member of the team's tasks, they'll need to know about it, right? That's why documentation is such an important part of a project manager's role. While your team may work deeply on specific areas of the project, you might be the only person on the team who is aware of and communicating across all the different areas of the project. Clear and consistent documentation can ensure transparency and clear communication. Documentation helps set the stage for the project. It communicates the answers to key questions. For example, what problem are you trying to solve? What are the project goals? What are the scope and deliverables? And who are the project stakeholders? And lastly, what resources does the team need to complete their work? This is all crucial information for anyone who's working on a project, regardless of their role. Documentation also helps preserve decisions made early on in the project and can serve as a reference point for team members who might join later in the project life cycle. It's your job to ensure that this information is easily accessible through some kind of formal documentation like an email, a presentation, or digital document. Also, documenting decisions can help you uncover tasks, timelines, or costs you hadn't previously considered. And lastly, this process provides a historical record that can be reviewed at the end of your project. You can apply the lessons you've learned in the future. Okay, let's get into different types of documentation. Up next, we'll look at project proposals and project charters, two types of documents that can set you up for success early on. See you soon. Hello, and welcome back. Earlier, we discussed the value of documentation in effective project management. Now let's talk about two common types of documentation you could use to keep track of details and keep your stakeholders informed. These are the project proposal and the project charter. A project proposal is a form of documentation that comes at the very beginning of the project. This document's purpose is to persuade stakeholders that a project should begin. And typically, a senior organizational leader creates the proposal. So you might not need to worry about creating the proposal, but you will have to keep track of the proposal's progress. The project proposal is a great starting point to help you understand the desired goals and impact. A proposal may be a formal document, a presentation, or even a simple email to get others on board with the idea. Then we have the project charter, a formal document that clearly defines the project and outlines the necessary details to reach its goals. A project charter helps you get organized, set up a framework for what needs to be done and communicate those details to others. So how do these documents differ? A project proposal is created earlier in the project life cycle than the project charter. The proposal kicks off the initiation phase by influencing and persuading the company to move forward with the project. The project charter serves a similar purpose and often comes at the end of the initiation phase. However, its goal is to more clearly define the key details of the project. Another difference between these two documents is that a charter will often serve as a point of reference throughout the life of a project. The proposal is only used at the earliest stages. Now that you know the difference between these two documents, let's take a closer look at the project charter, which you'll learn more about in this module. The project charter makes clear that the benefits of a project 
outweigh the costs. As you learned earlier in this course, there are a few questions you might ask yourself when performing a cost-benefit analysis. That includes questions like, what value will this project create? How much money could this project save my organization? And how much time will people have to spend on this project? You will include the answers to these questions in your charter. Including this type of information ensures that you and your stakeholders agree on the project value. The charter also helps ensure that you and your stakeholders agree on the details of the project. Project charter approval means that management is supportive and it's also a key step to ensure that the project matches the needs of the organization. After the stakeholders and project sponsor has reviewed and approved the project charter, you now have the authority to move forward with the project. Project charters can be formatted in a few ways and can contain different information depending on the project and the organization. The information in a charter might also be tailored to its audience or the needs of specific stakeholders. For example, if you're writing a project charter for a stakeholder who is a marketing executive, the charter might include information about how the project will impact the organization's brand. Or if the stakeholder is the chief technology officer, the charter might include information on the costs of engineering resources needed to maintain the project. Regardless of the format or the audience, Creating a project charter is a best practice for ensuring that everyone agrees on how to move forward before entering the planning phase. The project charter is a living document. This means that it can evolve as the project progresses. As the project manager, you'll review and refine the charter throughout the process. Now that you know more about the value of a project charter, it's time to learn how to create one. Meet me in the next video to get started. Hi again, let's talk about how to create a project charter. In the last video, we discussed how project charters are a valuable document for project managers. Project charters are key for securing approval from stakeholders and moving forward. Project charters can also be formatted in many different ways, and there are many different templates available online for you to choose from. Here, We'll use a template that's similar to one that program managers often use at Google. And to fill in each section, we'll use details from your project at Office Green. Ready? Let's take a look. At the top of your charter, you want to add in the name of your project. Let's add in the name of your project at Office Green. It's called Project Plant Pals. You also want to add in a brief summary. Let's type that in. Our plan is to offer high volume customers small low maintenance plants that can thrive in an office environment. Next up, let's fill in the section labeled project goals. Remember that goals should be smart, which means that they are specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time bound. Let's add in the goal for project plant pals which is to increase revenue by 5% by rolling out a new service that provides office plants to top clients by the end of the year. Great, now let's add in the project deliverable. Remember that a deliverable is a tangible outcome from a project. As you learned earlier, our deliverables for this project are to send 1,000 plants to 100 customers and to launch a new website for orders and customer support. Okay, now let's add in the business case, which captures the reasoning for initiating this project. Let's type in, this is a top requested service from our customers, and it will also improve customer satisfaction and retention. The business case is supported by the cost-benefit analysis, and we'll add that in now. Let's start with the benefits. The benefits, or expected gains of the project, include improving customer satisfaction and an increase in revenue. Now we'll move on to the costs. The costs include the price of the sourcing products, developing a website, and marketing materials. 
Let's type in $250,000 for the estimated budget. Nice! We've now outlined some of the benefits and costs of this project. Keep in mind that these are simple examples to teach you the basics of filling out a charter. When running a real project, you perform a more detailed analysis to determine the benefits and costs. The key takeaway here is that benefits should always outweigh the costs. Fantastic! Let's keep going. Next, we're going to add in the project scope, as well as what's considered out of scope for this project. Remember, scope is an agreed upon understanding of what is included or excluded from a project. An item that is in scope includes creating a service to deliver small plants to last year's top clients. An item that is out of scope and therefore not available to customers includes plant care after they're delivered. Amazing! Hopefully you can see how stating what's in scope and what's out of scope helps everyone working on the project understand where they should focus their efforts. Great! Now let's add in your project team. Let's see here. The project sponsor is Office Green's Director of Product. So let's add that in. Who is the project lead? Well, that's you. The project team may include marketing associates, website developers, and external plant vendors, and more. So we can add in a few important project team members here. Awesome. Let's move on to additional stakeholders. Additional stakeholders may include the Vice President of Customer Success, who is accountable for customer feedback and corresponding product requests. We can also add in the Account Manager, who will leverage their existing relationships with top clients. And let's also add in the Fulfillment Manager, who will help acquire the plants needed to launch this service. We're almost done. Let's add in how we'll measure success. Here, we'll type in that we want to see a 5% increase in revenue by the end of the year. Let's also type in that we want to hit a customer satisfaction rate of 95% three months after launch. That's it! The project charter is filled in and now it's ready to be reviewed by your stakeholders. Now you're done! You've seen how documentation helps form the roots of a project and how it contributes to the project's ultimate success. Like nurturing a plant, you're learning to nurture a project to ensure it's the best it can be. Up next, we'll talk about the tools that project managers rely on to guide their teams and ensure that they complete their tasks. See you soon! As a project manager, tools are some of the most helpful resources you have at your disposal. They're essential for tracking progress, so it's important to keep them top of mind throughout the entire project. Let's talk more about why tools are so useful and why it's important to choose the right ones for your needs. There are lots of different tools out there, and you'll learn more about them later. As a reminder, tools are aids that make it easier for a project manager or team to manage resources and organize work. They're useful because they can help you track detailed information about all kinds of tasks, and they make it easy to communicate with lots of different people. And remember, effective communication and tracking are huge parts of a project manager's day-to-day -day responsibilities. Just think about how much tougher your job would be without help from collaboration tools like email or digital documents created in Google Docs or Microsoft Word. Let's imagine this in the context of our project at Office Green. As lead project manager, you have tons of information about the company's plan to provide office-friendly plans to top clients. But what would happen if you wrote every project detail on a whiteboard instead of a shared online document? Well, every member of your team would have to stop by your desk to get the latest information. And that's definitely not the most efficient use of anyone's time. But if you store this information in easily accessible online documents, you save everyone on the team time, energy, and a major headache. 
today's tools have made it so much easier to share information with teammates. Even better, with project management tools, information sharing goes both ways. That means team members can also easily update you on their progress without the need for extra meetings or phone calls. How great is that? When you choose the right tool for a project, you make it easy for teammates to let you know if a task is on schedule or if it's delayed, which lets you quickly see how any changes might affect the rest of the project. Project management tools increases visibility and transparency for everyone, including stakeholders. You can use a variety of tools to accomplish many different things, like tracking progress on tasks, deliverables, and milestones. Tools can also help you manage a budget, build helpful charts and diagrams, manage contracts and licenses, and keep stakeholders informed. Tools can be straightforward, like digital spreadsheets or documents, or they can be more sophisticated, like scheduling and work management software. It's important to think about the needs of the project when choosing which to use. One thing to keep in mind is that if you choose a more sophisticated tool, your teammates and stakeholders will need some time to get familiar with it. For small projects, that might be more trouble than it's worth. So for small projects, a straightforward tool might be more effective. But if a project has a big scope, then it might be worth the team's time to learn and ultimately work with a more sophisticated project management tool. You should also keep in mind that sometimes you won't have a choice about the types of tools you use. If an organization has already decided to use a specific tool, then you will need to work with what they give you. It's all about remaining flexible. Are you starting to see how you can use tools to keep projects on track? Whether they're straightforward or sophisticated, tools have the power to help you communicate and manage more effectively. Next up, we'll cover some of the most common types of tools for effective project management. See you there. Hi there. So you've learned about how tools can make you more effective. Now let's learn more about the different types of tools used in project management. These include scheduling and work management software and tools for productivity and collaboration. Let's get started. One common tool type is scheduling and work management software. There are lots of different types of work management software on the market, including popular tools like these. Certain tools may work better for your project depending on a bunch of things. For example, the project methodology you're running or the number of tasks and people involved. So, why would you choose to use scheduling and work management software? Well, it can be really useful for assigning tasks to multiple teammates and for tracking progress on that work. It can also help you visualize your team's progress. For example, if you're using work management software to assign and track tasks, you're more likely to notice if your team completes 50 tasks one week and just three tasks the following week. That's a clear sign that you need to check in to see if there's a problem that's blocking progress. If you hadn't been tracking their tasks, you might not have noticed the issue. That's part of the reason why work management software is so useful. It provides an overview of how the project is going, so you know when you need to check in with your teams to get tasks back on track. Another type of project management tool we'll discuss is tools for productivity. Productivity tools can be very helpful for you and your team. This includes word processing tools like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. You can use these to create shared documents with the team, like the project charter we taught you how to fill out earlier. You can also use these tools to build documents like meeting agendas and status updates and we'll talk more about these in a later course. Spreadsheets are another useful productivity tool. They're versatile, and you can use them to make documents like RACI charts and project plans, as well as other helpful charts you'll learn more about in a later course. And presentations created in tools like Microsoft PowerPoint, Keynote, or Google Slides can be a great way to package your project in a visual, easily digestible way. Now, let's discuss collaboration tools. 
which you'll probably rely on to work closely with your teammates. These include tools you're probably familiar with, like email and chat. Tools like this can help you quickly and efficiently check in with each other on questions, comments, and other topics related to the project. Productivity tools like documents and spreadsheets and collaboration tools like email and chat are all pretty simple, which means they're great for smaller projects with fewer tasks and teammates to keep track of. Scheduling and work management software is better for bigger projects with a larger number of tasks and a bigger team of people to manage. Cool, you've learned more about the types of tools available to you, including scheduling and work management software, productivity tools, and collaboration tools. We'll spend the next video diving a bit deeper on some of the most popular project management tools out there. Meet you there. Earlier, you learned about different types of project management tools, from scheduling and work management software to tools for productivity and collaboration. Now let's discuss a few popular tools you might be expected to use or at least be familiar with. There are many different types of work management software that automatically make project planning and tracking a lot easier and that are much more efficient than manual project tracking. One tool that we'll focus on in this program is Asana. Asana is a work management platform that helps teams plan and coordinate their work from daily tasks to strategic initiatives. Asana provides a living system and a source of truth where everyone's work lives. With Asana, everyone can see, discuss, and manage team priorities, giving teams clarity on who is doing what by when. It's great for building project plans, assigning tasks, automating workflows, tracking progress, and communicating with stakeholders. As a project manager, you can use Asana to create a log of tasks, like gathering cost estimates from external vendors and assign a task to people on the team. All tasks are visible and organized in the format of the project manager's choice, like in a list or on a calendar, and designed to drive transparency and connection with all the tasks related to the overall goal. It's easy to use with external stakeholders as well. Because within Asana, you can share status updates and other communications with people outside your company. Another great tool we'll focus on throughout this program is the spreadsheet. Spreadsheets are extremely versatile, and you can use them for a wide range of tasks, from creating timelines and building charts to managing budgets and tracking tasks. You can add and view project information in a variety of formats, depending on what you need in the moment. For example, let's say you enter a list of tasks, due dates, completion statuses, and task owners into a spreadsheet. From there, it's very simple to sort the list by due date to see what's due next. You can then filter the list of tasks by task owner so that you'll only see the things you're responsible for. You can also highlight the rows of the sheet in different colors to visually illustrate the tasks with the least progress. With spreadsheets, you can easily transform, visualize, and manipulate information. Spreadsheets and more comprehensive tools like Asana are just two options for effective project management. And it's a good idea to get a basic understanding of a variety of software options out there. Then, if your company doesn't have a standard software tool, you can choose the right one for the project needs. Being able to recommend the right tool for the job can be a great way to add value to your team at the beginning of a project. Keep in mind, however, that software options are constantly changing from the addition of new features to the launch of new tools. There's no way for you to know every software available, and no company would expect that of you. Many of these tools have similar functionality, like task tracking and task assignment. So if you understand one tool deeply, you should be able to easily adapt to a new tool on the job. Now that you've learned a bit more about Asana and the power of spreadsheets, Take some time to explore these tools, 
since we'll be working with them later in the program. Coming up, you'll hear from a project manager who will tell you all about their experience using tools during their day-to-day -day role at Google. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Amar. I'm a senior engineering program manager at Google Shopping. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I drive programs which spans across multiple products at Google. As a project manager, tools are our best friends. Tools and the tools which will help us drive the execution, those are really should be near and dear to us. And those are near and dear to me. What I look at is what tools which help me create the body of work. There are like a lot of open source tools as well as free tools like you know Google Spreadsheets are there, Google Docs is there. So many of these tools are out there. And there are some other uh, supporting tools also like Jira and all. These will help you create the body of work. This will help you define that what needs to be delivered and when. This will help you create the timeline. Like there are timeline tools like Gantt chart, Gantt tools that you will find out. Uh, and then there are tools which will help you drive the uh, visibility across the board and the drive the uh, dependent ecosystem. We want to make sure when we are starting at the project, we look at the available tool set so that we are not defragging the system that much. We are not really kind of adding too many complexities or new tools in the ecosystems. We want to make sure that, okay, what are the current tools which are out there? Have a look at those tool set. Find out, are those supported? Find out what's the current adoption rate and look at what are the gaps. If there are gaps, go for new tools, propose new tools to improve productivity. But if there's existing tool set which our team is following, which your team is following, try to learn those tools because those are the tools which will get quick adoption and those will be an amazing tool set to have uh, with you. Nice work. Getting through all this material is a huge accomplishment. Take a moment to consider how much you've learned so far about the ins and outs of successfully kicking off a project. You dug deeper on initiation, the first phase of the project life cycle, and how important it is to determine your project scope, including what's in scope and what's not. You also learned about project goals and deliverables and you learn how to measure project success by creating success criteria early on. Then you learn to define project roles and responsibilities. Choosing the right people for a project team is a big decision and one you'll always want to consider carefully. You now know how to create a stakeholder analysis that tells you how and when to communicate with different stakeholders. And you learn how to create and track team accountability using a RACI chart. You also study the final steps of the initiation phase, identifying resources, creating documentation, and selecting tools. You learned about the resources that project managers rely on to achieve the goals of a project, from budgets to people to the materials needed to complete a deliverable. You also learned the value of documenting your work using a project charter, which is a key step to getting approval to start your project. Lastly, you learned about the many types of tools that can help you be a more efficient project manager, from straightforward tools like email to sophisticated tools like Asana. Completing this course is no small feat, and you've put in hours of work. Give yourself a pat on the back. You've earned it. In the next course, you'll jump right into the next phase of the project lifecycle, and my colleague Rowena will be your guide. Get ready to have some fun as Rowena shows you the ropes of serious project planning.